complicated, you know, man. I got dang old Rubik's Cube, man. You like talking about that blue bread, man. Then you get to one side, they plug it, man. All right, Spoon, how you doing, man? All right, good evening to you. Or morning. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for uh, what? Because it is very late where you are. Quite so literally, I, yes. <laughs> I appreciate that, but also because uh, I mean, this is a teaser for an episode upcoming. But I had uh, I had Daryl Cooper Barter made on, and we ran we ran pretty late, and so uh, I had a very short turnaround. So thanks for bearing with me. I don't worry about it. So good. for maybe the the members in my audience who who aren't familiar with you, could you just kind of quickly describe you know who you are and, and what you do on the internet? I am a smooth talking glorified shed poster. That's probably like the best way that I can describe what I do. Um, I would say um, I'm the aristocratic utensil, hi, or spoon, as uh, more people know me as. Um, my content, as far as YouTube goes, is, like I said, glorified shit posting, and I am a monarchist. Uh, I was born in South Africa, which maybe would explain why I'm a monarchist, because once, uh, once you start looking at your country going to hell because of democracy, you tend not to favor it very well. And so when everyone else sings its praises, you tend to be the dissident person going, yeah, I see where this goes really, really wrong. And then um, sort of starting off from that, it makes it very easy to jump in any kind of dissident direction. Um, and that's basically sort of what made me make the channel is slowly I sort of just went from that to something is really, really wrong. And then that led me to the direction of we should return to something that isn't currently what's being used because what's currently being used does not function in any way the way it's supposed to. And um, yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's an interesting, an interesting point. You know, from the from the Western perspective, right, there were sort of these like bevy of fashionable social causes to devote yourself to from roughly like yeah. the 70s to the 90s. And South Africa, just as a general thing, was kind of one of those, right? It was like, you know, ending the troubles in Ireland, Israel, Palestine, getting rid of nuclear bombs and fixing South Africa. But, you know, <laughs> after, you know, the sort of... Fixing ring- is a really bad term to use here. <laughs> yeah, true, fair enough. But after the sort of like, you know, the end of apartheid, you know, the, yes. the rainbow nation, you know, we in the West just sort of forgot about it. And then, you know, in 2014 the movie Chappie comes out and we're like, oh, wait, that country still exists. I wonder how they're doing, right? But yeah, obviously in that well. intervening period, <laughs> things uh, ceased working, right? Yes. And uh, not in a particularly good way. And um, n- not in a way that I think people would, would really like to because something that I've noticed about our current timeline is the woke thing, um, just to fucking jump head first into it, I'm under the impression, uh, how can I say this in a polite way? It's trying to it's trying to become the epitome of the American ideal of the uh, all men are created equal, when in reality that's just not true. I mean, uh, no, you're you're why that isn't right. Yeah. But why that isn't true is the bit that's that's kind of interesting. Cause um I had a really terrifying thought a while ago. Um, and there's no blunt way to say this, or the way that isn't blunt, is I'm under the impression that the only reason we have a disgust of segregation and slavery is because of politics. It's nothing to do with morality. Well, no, you're 100% right. And you see that in the reveal yeah. preference, right? Like America yes. has resegregated itself. You know, and yes. really it was only through like bizarre social engineering that it was ever not the case. You know, obviously yeah. there were, you know, so we say like, and, and we're probably on the same page here, so we'll have to speak delicately. But the <laughs> upper for the upper bound of a population that had been historically economically disadvantaged, let's put it that way. Yes. You know, that kind of like top two percent. That obviously that obviously was a problem. But you know, in the in the effort to equalize it, right, to realize that all men are created equal idea, which you know, has some, we can trace that idea back. Well, yes. we basically leveled the playing field and instead of that dis- disadvantaged group rising up, we just blew apart any sort of social 
institutions they had whatsoever and just created this like immiserated underclass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that that's also where it's gone really, really wrong. And um you've had Scrum Monkey on. Yeah, um, yeah, I've had Scrum on. Yeah, so I, I spoke to him about this because when I started to see this all go really, really wrong, I said to him, dude, the stupidity of where we're currently going, um, is the regime doing this to like manufacture like a race war? <laughs> and he said to me, he laughed and said to me, you would think that, wouldn't you? But he said, no, it's this is just a byproduct they don't really foresee as a problem. And I just looked at him and went, there is no way I'm, I'm having a hard time believing that because you have to be completely idiotic to actually think this isn't going to be a problem. And that's kind of the thing that I wanted to speak to him about when I first noticed this, because I just went, there is a clear differences between groups of people. And if you can't discuss that differences, and if you leave it to something to say, oh, well, it's, it's, it's just culture. And you go, uh, really, it's just culture. So why can I see the same uh, <clears throat> cultural problem across the same group across three different continents that's that's a strange cultural problem when it's across three different continents and different languages like you want to allow me to maybe make a guess as to what that culture is and why it's amongst this particular group that mm, and if you can't have a discussion about why that is the case because people are going to think well i have some <clears throat> unsavory opinions as to why that is the case and I'm being told I can't discuss what I'm thinking, it's going to lead people to think that that thing that you can't talk about is the correct thing when the solution that you offer, which is that it's just a cultural problem, and clearly that is not the case, that's where you get a growing concern of, yeah, it's it's not really this thing that you claim it is. And then you go down a rabbit hole and you end up with very dissident kind of opinions. Well, well certainly. And I think that... This is sort of a deep, deep frustration I have with conservatives, you know, is that yes. conservatives will go blue in the face saying the differences between men and women are innate and biological. There's no difference, particularly like the IDW types, kind of reformed liberals yes. will just go blue Agreed. in the face saying this. And they are correct about that. But if you apply that logic even one more time, Right. Like I won't say exactly where, but that it applies to any other sort of innate human characteristic. They lose their mind. And yeah. so from a certain perspective, right, the the true the, the leftoids, right? The true like equality is the end of politics, right? The that yes. kind of raison d'etre of the left are almost more consistent, right? Because they have taken their logic and applied it. They are wrong and they are more wrong. Yeah. But the, the kind of mealy-mouthed conservative, the, one of the reasons they always lose is because they they have an internal contradiction baked into them. They want to sort of stop yeah, absolutely. at the midpoint between in this argument. Yeah, and um, that that's generally speaking something that conservatives have a problem with. Um, and it's a lot of the, the sort of 90s liberals also have the same kind of thing. Like, um, I hate to drag up his name here, but uh, Short Fat Otaku, Dev, is... Um, He's like this. He, he's what the AA calls like the return to Fresh Prince of Bel Air kind of mentality, which is that if only we could go back to this time because it's perfect. And like, okay, well, you can't go back because we've seen too much of the regime where it wants to go. Number one, and two, you you have to change the trajectory if you wish to go back anywhere. Like, and so that's kind of a contradiction in in terms of you can't unsee what you've already seen and go back and without knowing that it's going to it's going to go to the exact same point that it is now and you don't change anything so you if you have a problem here you must change the trajectory that it's going on now and why well and that's actually so there there are two things i want to get to there which is one i'll do something i almost never do and compliment chat on something uh that el yeah. has the point that conservatives aren't even making the argument that I'm talking about, which is true. They're not even yeah, saying agreed. that there are any mental or emotional differences. It's purely physical, which that is a valid point to bring up. Uh, yeah, but agreed. also, uh, this is another thing that drives me up the wall. So look, look, I'm a young guy. I wasn't alive during very much of the 90s. But the, the mythologized 90s is something we really need to address because the 90s weren't like that. 
the 90s had massive race riots in the US, right? If you've seen in black culture, you know, kind of like hip hop art from the time, there'll be a lot of like very stylized, like Tudor crowns, right? They'll be like fake gold plated yes. or whatever. And that was a cultural signifier, right? Because what you would do is as a, you know, as, as a black guy is you put one of those, you know, in the backseat of your car, you know, you put it prominently. And what that signified is, okay, you're one of us, you know, I won't steal your yeah. car. I won't take your stuff. And, you know, on the other side, the white side, like you have bands like Pantera who are basically white nationalists, you know, if you nice. really get down to it, uh, and Selvo is uh, selling out stadiums. And so this myth yeah. of the deracialized nineties is really not something that people who lived through the time talk about. It's something that millennials primarily who were young children speak about that's, because that's what that's, they saw in media. Yeah. That's also the reason why they speak so fondly about it is because they were kids. But it's the same thing. And they it's think like of we, it as a, as a better time. Yeah. But that, that, that's the reason why they don't really think of it politically. They, they say that, but in reality, it's just because no life was easier than the nineties. And that's the reason why they actually gravitate towards it because they weren't alive to actually know about the politics. Like you just said, if you examine it politically, then you go, wow, there's a whole lot of mess of crap here. But because they weren't politically active at the, at the time, they were children like I was. I was born in 89. So I also have a fond memory of the 90s. You know? um, but as far as the, the politics goes, like, no, obviously, there's way of my head because I was a kid. So, yeah, there you go. Well, and you see this from the IDW types. They are nostalgic for the 90s for a different reason, right? They're a little bit older. But they're nostalgic for the 90s because they were liberal college professors in the 90s. And so essentially, yeah. society viewed them as cool and everything was better in my day <laughs> yeah everything was better yeah. when i was in charge and everyone liked me yeah like no shit yeah, like, of course you yeah. Say that. <laughs> yeah css virginia the oj the oj trial is another example of that right like, it's really kind of just people that want to reclaim like their heyday oh yeah exactly it's like uncle, it's kind of sad it's like uncle rico from napoleon dynamite right like talking about the yeah, big game much. he won in 76 yeah. and yeah. i mean there's a certain part of that right it's like nostalgia is probably a little healthy but you know, taking yes. that sort of nostalgia of another generation and turning it into your politics is retarded, right? It's easy to point out with the boomer cons talking about how great the 1950s were, you know, at least in America, that, that you yeah. can point out that and say, that's dumb, don't do it. But when it's your own nostalgia, it's a little bit harder to, uh, to notice that, uh, I guess, that kind of like yeah. rhetorical trick. Especially if you were naive during it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that's that's another thing that's so interesting about this. And you see this with it's really easy to see with the U.S. intelligence agencies, right? Like people oh, who God. view themselves as like very like cynical. They'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, the CIA shot Kennedy, you know, or like, oh, the FBI was, you know, doing something in the 50s that was nasty. But uh, I'm sure glad they got Trump, you know, like it, yeah. <laughs> it's real this time. They said they stopped lying. So they must have stopped lying. You know, it's like yeah, this that's, weird um, revisionist history. Curtis brought that up as well uh, when he said, um, when you looked at how they behaved during um, the whole laptop thing with Hunter Biden, is that the the intelligence apparatus in like the 1950s had a very good reputation for being pro-America. And so basically there was a, a co-option of that mentality of they are still objectively good. Um, and this was... a uh, that reputation was used to essentially shut all over First Amendment rights, basically, because of this this reputation. It was the case of like, oh, well, yeah, it's totally in the interest of, say, Twitter and Facebook to do what the state wants to do because the the apparatus had a, a good reputation amongst the people. And that's, you know, not exactly a, a fair one at this point because the reputation has been horrible for anyone who's been paying attention. And uh, you, you can sort of see like, who is really politically clued in and who is just a pleb that will have absolutely no problem with the state being weaponized as long as it's their politics being approved, which is kind of creepy. Well, well, certainly. Right. And this goes back to, you know, the argument against democracy, right. That, and it's funny, I was actually, and I actually think I'm contractually not allowed to say who, which is a little bit weird for me to say, but I recently spoke to someone who's kind of a prominent, uh, regime conservative. I'm not sure I entirely enjoyed the experience, but nonetheless, you know, he really like pushed me on the idea of, you know, American, America as a Republic, like, Oh, we're a Republic. We're a Republic. 
But the problem is, right, it doesn't really matter what it says on the box, right? It doesn't really matter what the description is. It's the output yes. that matters. And so you yes. have a situation, right, where, okay, if you look at the kind of like civics class version of how your country works, sure, it's a democracy. But like, let's just take the intelligence agencies, right? Like, The Department of Defense admits that they pay Call of Duty to make them look cool. And that's a stupid example, right? But if they've ex they've admitted that, they've gone out and say like, yeah, that's something we do. One, what don't they admit? And then two. Oh, that's a good point. Well, just two, right? Like, look at all of the connections between industry, the intelligence agencies, and and media, right? And realistically, yes. what is the difference if it's okay? Well, technically, this organization isn't owned by the state. But in the case of CNN, they rose to prominence because they were embedded in U.S. forces during the, uh, I believe it was the Gulf War, right? With the express permission of intelligence. They get sources from intelligence. They get people who either used to work or will work in the future in intelligence. And it's like, okay, realistically, guys, what's the difference between just cutting to the chase and just having American Pravda? You know, because at least then you know, you know, at least then it's formalized, yeah. right? To take a, a line from Moldbug. But to me, it's like, we don't really, we say we have a democracy. We don't. Even if yeah. I'm not saying we should have one, I'm not a big fan of democracy, but like, what's really the harm in, in kind of formalizing the arrangement we already have? Because at least then it's like, you don't have to pretend to get upset about it. I think the reason why is because um, the the psychological the sort of the, the the psychological boon that democracy offers people is what also what makes the regime a lot more stable from the inside it's because um i said this to a friend of mine i said the way to think of democracy in your regime is basically the voters are garbage cans in the sense that you basically get thrown garbage down your gullet as much as you can up until the garbage cans are full and that would be the corruption and in which case uh, election day comes around and the garbage bags are empty or the garbage cans are emptied and then the election season starts again and the whole thing starts until the next election cycle and the garbage goes back in again and that's basically it it's the, the election is basically just the recycling of the garbage because you get the exact same freaking problems or always over and over again in a cycle well, and Nick Land makes this point in Dark Enlightenment, where he's basically like, look, a thrifty politician is an evolutionary dead end. That is a bad politician. Because look at the yeah. incentive structure, right? Like, let's yeah, say 100%. you have four years. Okay, if you're thrifty, right, you are leaving resources for your opponents to take, to help their friends and to punish their enemies. But if you are yes. going to the moon, spending as much as you can with the time you have, that is given the incentive structure of a term limit or right, or like a, you have to come up for a vote again, right? And at least in the US, an unlimited money spigot, right? You can literally spend as many dollars as there are. We'll just money machine go burr, right? Like yeah. it, that is, if we're looking at this from an evolutionary perspective, that will select for the people who are best at playing that game. You know, and this goes back yeah. to the Hoppian point, which is like these people have no responsibility, no attachment to the system. They're basically yeah. just there There's to no stake get in the theirs game. while they can. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is um, that is the biggest problem that I I actually found reading Hopper as well. And I realized something that, uh, and I also I said this to Scrump as well. I said the the way to look at democracy versus monarchy is to imagine that you are an engineer. Because the way that the, uh, the democratic types look at the system is think, no, the design is fine. We just need better components. And the way the monarchical engineers look at the system and go like, no, the entire design is shit. Scrap it. You can never get the components to make this work. And something that I said um, in one of my videos before, and I thought this was kind of weird, is the way that your, the way that your system is set up in a, in a democracy and I'm not a fan of politics, but I or a fan of politicians rather, but I have to defend them in this sense. Because as a politician in the regime, it is not possible for you to behave like a normal human being. Because in uh, the way a normal human being works is when they do something bad, they course correct. 
The problem is in politics, this is not really very possible because if you're a politician, your whole job is to represent somebody else. Like in theory, you have no mind of your own because you just do the will of somebody else. Now, the problem with this is, what if your people want to do something really stupid? Now, you can say, well, it is my job to give them what they want, but okay, but w what if your constituents are really dumb and they do something that is catastrophically bad for the country in general? They, you are essentially an agent of chaos. You may be good for your constituents, but you're bad for the country. And if it's a good deal for you personally, you might do it, especially if you get like short-term political gain from it. But in the long run, if it's really, really bad, well, you fake do it anyway, because by the time you get out of office, they won't realize it's you that's done the damage and you will, you will suffer no consequences because you're out of office. And the voters are too freaking stupid to realize that, hey, look, we are actually the ones that voted for this dumb shit and we're actually responsible because for some bizarre reason, it doesn't ever occur to people, despite the fact that your politicians are not supposed to do anything what they're supposed to do of their own free will because they listen to you, is that when they do do something that is actually bad for the country. No voters look at them, look at each other and go, maybe we want dumb shit. So you, your politicians always have the capacity to just say, well, it's not my fault because I'm just representing somebody else. Well, and that's another thing, right? Which is that I'm not entirely convinced, and this is a this is a point from Demestra, right? Which is that I'm not entirely convinced power works that way, right? Transferring power. Oh yeah, it doesn't. Uh, Again, just because like we we see that you know we've run this you know a Republican experiment in you know the U.S. for roughly like, 250 years plus or minus, and we've run a a truly kind of democratic version of that. I mean, really, since Andrew Jackson, who I I like more than most, you know, but he 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 did kind of open up the franchise, and if that mechanism worked as described in civics class, we would have seen it happen. But yeah. if anything, we've seen the sort of aristocratic pretensions in – which because America did have an aristocracy, particularly in yes. the American South. And those have slowly been shed over time. We've become more and more egalitarian. And have are we greater for it? Like are we producing no. more geniuses? Are we producing better art? And no, we're not. We're, we're descending into you know mediocrity, sort of drowning in a bathtub. And, you know, this is why I get really annoyed again, and I'm just going to bash conservatives because they need to listen to this. Feel free. <laughs> which is, look, you are so desperate to gain moral approval from the left. You want to be I seen as cool, as well. one of the good ones. But the left has no moral superiority. They don't. They produce yeah. worse results for every layer of society. Even groups yes. that I am not a member of, I'm not a particular fan of living near, but nonetheless, I can look at it objectively and say, those people have it worse than they did in a more ordered, right? More hierarchical society. And to me, I, I think that, and this is good, this is kind of a bitter pill for you know me as a as an American and us in the in the West generally, which is that kind of unlimited personal autonomy, unlimited freedom is not a good thing, at least for the vast yeah. majority of us. Um, that's, that's kind of an interesting point because this is something that I, I realized a while ago and I was listening to, um, the side scrollers podcast earlier and, uh, something that I don't like that conservatives do is they have this really weird obsession with like neutral and I don't like the fact that there's neutrality. And from my perspective, I think if you're right wing, you should make overtly right-wing things and like be unapologetic about it. Like your your job is not to, um, your job is not to to put something in their face to like shun them. Your job is to make something badass that draws people to you. So you're not you're not supposed to make something that specifically appeals. Just make something that is good that is also right-wing that can attract a normie. Make your side look better. There's a, a, a line that the that Mulberg used, which was, uh, create greatness as if your enemies don't even exist. And I really wish conservatives would do that with their own ideology because they are significantly better than the left in every fucking way, but they can't market that. Which kind of drives me insane because you have everything going for you. Your ideas are better. You're objectively better looking people. And you can just run a functionally better society. Why don't you lead with this? Like you have so much fucking ammo. 
Well, and this actually goes goes to another point, right? Which is, which is what do we mean by right wing? So if we look at the left as this sort of force of egalitarian entropy, right? Bringing all things down to the lowest common denominator. The right yeah. wing basically just becomes when things work. And so like, that's why the right is as many things as like, you know, like, like French Catholic royalists, you know, and also like, Franco, I guess, technically, but also the car, like all of these different factions that don't necessarily have one unifying thing other than just like hating the lunatics, ruining everything. But yeah, because of that, right. You look at art in general, right? Like the, the entire canon and it's like, well, is, is Shakespeare right wing? And it's like, well, it's true. So yes, but yes, not yeah. <laughs> necessarily in the way that left wing media is left wing. Right. There's not some kind of like political formula at the end where you say like, you know, Donkey Kong says trans rights or whatever, like, you know, people. on on (laughs) And so I I think that that that's some of it. Right. Is that things becoming politicized is sort of inherently left wing. Right. To go back to land, he talks about the left sort of thriving on dialectic. Right. Thriving when things are up for debate. You know, this is a tactic they've used a lot talking past the sale. So for instance, right, you may have noticed that no one talks about gay marriage anymore. It's assumed. Yeah. Because we're talking about trans kids, right? We've moved past that. And the scope of what is political, like gay marriage is still certainly political, but it's grown and grown and grown. And you look at a pre-existing order and don't get me wrong, politics is still real. People still get into fights, in many cases, more violent than ours, like the, like in the Ghibellines and the Gelds or the, you know, any kind of faction you see that still exists. But what are they debating? Right. They're debating, okay, what is the highest authority? But are they debating? And that's a huge question, right? But are they debating what is it to be a man? What is it to be a woman? The the scope of politics has from a certain perspective grown. And really, like when you talk about something about like monarchy, right? Monarchy is is depoliticizing people like you and I, because we are no longer part of the political process. And so we don't yeah. have to necessarily, I mean, I, I doubt the government would even need to you know, talk about things like sex and gender, because that's not really within the scope of a, a monarch in that kind of depoliticized sense. Yeah. It's also not beneficial for his regime to do something or to deconstruct something like that. Like what the hell is he gain? Nothing. Exactly. It is only useful yeah. now. One is just pure ideological possession, right? Like equality yeah. at all costs, but also because it's a really good tactic to, gin up a voter base, right? To say like, oh, the, yeah. you know, the Nazis want to make it so you can't have butt marriage anymore. <laughs> this is a good, I actually have, um, I was discussing this with a friend of mine earlier, um, why I think that is such a problem for the conservatives and why, why this is a difficult thing for them to discuss in the current framework. Um, and from, from what I can tell, and this is like uh, sort of the libertarian frame, is that if I were to look at the the sort of problem that the right has in in the sort of typical political sense of the Aristotelian forms, the rule of the many, rule of the few, rule of the one, the way that the, the right sort of looks at the their worldview is they don't. Um, the libertarians, the NAP is like the main thing they value. They value liberty above absolutely everything. And they don't want to use any kind of essentially organized or institutional force of power because they, they deem the they deem doing so as the intrusion of some other overarching power on your life. And therefore, this is a great taboo according to their principles. Now, I, I can understand that. But the thing of it is, you want to live in you want to live in a certain world where there is an order but the libertarians don't want to actually discuss how does that order get maintained and stay maintained because it's all it's it's very kind of you know uh, fancy just like we flick a switch and you know everyone is behaving the same way in a moralistic way like okay but that's not the way the world works so you have to look at it there's two regulating forces. It's either you, religion, or the state will make corrections. That is how it always works in every regime. And the way that they look at it is, say you look at the a king and the peasantry. 
Now, the way it should work in theory is that the king looks after the peasantry. But in our system, because of Western democracy, I would say, is we look at, specifically America, because of the way it was founded, they look at centralized power as a very, very bad thing. Now, they don't look at it, what the centralized power can do. Just the fact that it is centralized at all seems to be a terrifying thing to Americans. This is why I have a great problem with telling the Americans, oh, look, a monarchy is terrifying to them. I'm like, okay, you realize your Congress has way more power than an absolute monarchy has ever had. Like the concentration of power, as soon as it's dissipated amongst more people, even if there is far more power in the state in general, they seem to be okay with it, which to me is frame breaking. I don't quite understand that. Well, one but thing they, I think that, and this is, this is sorry, I just want to, provide a, a bit yeah, of context that when we talk about Americans and centralized authority, that is very much something that is a characteristic of the right, which is a holdover from a previous era. What the yes. left has is a, they love power. They love power, yes. but they have this performative charade. And if you look at the sort of civic religion, right, the, the like political formula, why America gets to rule the world, why it justifies that to itself, it is fundamentally anti-fascism. It is, we saved yes. the world from mustache man. Therefore, we get to have an empire. And anyone who opposes yeah. us, whether that be you know Vladimir Putin, uh, Saddam Hussein, Hamas, people who don't want to wear a mask, Donald Trump or Richard Nixon, they're all fascists. They're all kind of like shadows yeah, this, of mustache man. The, the boogeyman man. of the regime, yeah. Exactly, which is framed as and sold to conservative Americans as centralized power, but it basically just means we get to social engineer our opposition the shit out of, out of existence. Everyone, yeah. Yes. And so I want to just say that because only the losers in American politics say that or believe it. You know, other yeah. people just say it and then continue to do what they want. But sorry, c carry on. Yeah. So something that, that that occurred to me, what the the conservatives generally don't like is they take this position and run it to an extreme. And in reality, if you look at the peasantry and the king, there exists a certain friction when it comes to power because they don't want to centralize power in their own mind, but they actually do, but they can't really say it because what they want is they sort of look at the centralized power and go, we don't want to give you ultimate power because we fear that you will tyrannize us. And the king looks at it and go, I don't want to give you ultimate power because you're going to overthrow me if I do anything wrong. So there exists this constant state of friction between two people who are very distrusting of one another. And the way that you resolve this is one of the people, either the, the, the one or the many, is going to have to trust the other one to let go of power and to just reign. And I would say in, in our time, it has to be the people. The people have to let go and the king has to be able to be a tyrant. And I know that sounds very, very scary to people, but let me frame it like this. If you are constrained by anything what's constraining you is the one that has power over you whereas if you have a king that can be a tyrant it means he has complete control which means if something goes wrong you know where to aim your 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 fire at and that's kind of the problem is that you like the jordan peterson just said like you must become a monster and then learn to control it that's kind of what you want from your king is you want your king to be able to be a tyrant but he must learn to control it because ultimately, at the end of the day, the people will look towards him and the, the many will look towards him and not the aristocracy. There's a line by, um, uh, by G.K. Chesterton where he said, the, the people in, in your country that have the most at stake in a good government is the peasantry because the rich can simply just fuck off if the regime goes to hell. So the people that have most in a say in, in the king ruling well is the little people, which is why Trump has such an enormous amount of fervor among the lower classes because he actually made their lives better. And so well, that's oh, that's something that, that people don't really consider. And I want people to, to realize that what you ultimately look for that is you want that executive because in the way that your system works, the balance of power, that's a false assumption because the way that your system is sold is Congress is supposed to act as a restraint on the executive. That's not true. Your Congress has a life of its own and will actively compete against the executive. That's the reality. Well, if you look at the actual seat of sovereignty in the U.S., right, if we take Schmidt's decision, it's right, it's, it's sovereign is he who decides the exception. 
And yeah, very recently, right, very prominently with, you know, the case of, of Trump being disallowed from the ballot. Well, who decides that? Well, the Supreme Court does. The Supreme and so Court they're does, yeah. exactly they're effectively the, the true sovereign in America. So yes. one thing that I, I think is, is interesting to look at this is that I think the only way we get out of this, right, is for someone to basically, and this is the this is the sort of the the wisdom in that, you know, that that fable about a, a Alexander cutting the Gordian knot, right? So for those who aren't familiar, there's this myth that Alexander came to this in this Greek city of Gordium. They had been without a king for a great many years. And the last king before he died tied this great massive knot and basically said, whoever, you know, whoever frees this knot will, will rule the world. And so Alexander yeah. hears of this, travels the by sword it, from Excalibur, yeah. It, it drew, exactly, drew his sword yeah. from the scabbard and cut straight through it, right? The idea, he literally just didn't even mess with the whole thing. And in that, right, you see that that sovereign decision, that idea to basically just say like, nope, I'm doing it, it's done. And he true to the fable, cut the knot and and conquered the world. And so the only way to get out of this is to have basically a man stand up and say like, I am responsible, this stops with me. You see this example yeah. in El Salvador with Bukele. You know, effectively yeah. someone stood up and said, nope, I am in charge. The adults are in the room, right? To paraphrase the Biden regime. Uh, crime is illegal again. <laughs> and what do we see? Yes. Crime becomes vanishingly small when it is illegal. Yes. Yeah, in a, in a disturbingly quick amount of time. And that's exactly. a, yeah, that's that's kind of the thing that I I, I don't really fear uh, this this horrifying thing of oh my good god we're gonna get a tyrant uh, immediately in in the regime I don't really see that that happening and I don't and I know America just said oh look America will never accept the king I'm like you realize how quickly you people accepted COVID and that drastically lowered your rights you were all in favor of it oh, we and, accepted. Uh... Like Saint Fauci, right? As this sort of yeah, like dictator exactly. of the world. Yeah. So I I don't see Americans as this great resistance force that they make it out to be. That's a giant lob. Scrum said something to me that was horrifying, and I said it to a friend of mine, and he was so demoralized because he realized it's true. He said the reason why Americans get to keep their guns is not because the regime fears them; it's because the exact opposite. It's because they know the Americans will never take up arms against the state. And and a friend of mine, Endeavor, who was recently on my podcast to discuss this, wrote an article about it and rustled all of the Jimmies, like just made everyone really, really <laughs> mad. And look, like I say this as someone who who enjoys guns quite a bit, right? It's, it's a hobby of mine. But nonetheless, yeah. right, this and again, this goes back to you know the 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 genesis of these narratives, right? Which is that these are kind of holdovers from a previous social order. And when we yeah. look at the last time like, private ownership of weapons really mattered against the state, we basically have like some coal strikes in the 1920s. You know, there was another, I can't remember, there was some standoff after World War II. And, and notwithstanding, right, cases like Kenosha, which like certainly I'm glad that that happened the way it did. But nonetheless, right, this is not the sort of like checkmate against tyranny as described. You know, there are certainly yeah, other no, benefits no, no, no. to it. But the reason that I go about attacking these is not because I have something kind of against conservative Americans, right? These are my people. But the problem is, right, you don't, like, if you're the most principled loser, you've still lost and these people yeah. hate you. You know, like going back to your point about like this sort of like, uh, you know, like Ross and Krieg or something that like our elites seem very interested in engineering, right? Like, that's not a good result. I don't want that to happen. And yeah, I agree. if these people are allowed to continue, you know, messing with the levers of power, if not that, they will engineer something very, very unpleasant. As I mean, not to throw your your nation under the bus, but look at South Africa. No, you, you know, can you could throw it under the bus, by the way. Fucking hell. Other people already have. You may as well fucking go ham happy. <laughs> well, right. And I don't say that like I'm not glad. I wish that weren't the case. But yeah. those are the same policies that are being implemented. You know, those are the same yeah, situations it'll, it'll, that are being happen. engineered. And it's like, well, it turns out if you do the route. same thing, you'll get the same result. Yeah. Uh, it's also something that is... <sighs> I don't even really even know what to make of that such show. It, it is just, uh, it's just an absolute clusterfuck to look at it. Um, because for, for me, 
I don't see that situation getting any better on the democracy. Like, I see my country going into autocracy inevitably. I just don't know when. But it is going to happen. It's going to go. It's going to get really, really ugly before it gets to that point. Because as much as people hate to say this, <laughs> I don't because <laughs> it's funnier that way. Um, the only way that country survives is under white rule. That is just a fact. Like, people can shriek all about it, but that is true. And it's funny. I've seen plenty of videos of black people being asked about this and they straight up just said give power back to the whites and to um to westerners that is absolutely frame breaking because oh look at democracy the rainbow nation like yeah that's not the real world in the real world the natives are utterly incompetent they never made any state they were a tribal group of of nomads essentially for the most part and half of them that are there don't even come from that region of the world they came from up north they just massacred the tribe as they move further south like they're just they're a, a conquering tribe. They don't know how to run a first world civilized nation. Like it's a joke to think that they can, but nobody wants to talk about that kind of thing. They just to think, well, you can just give these people education, and they're going to be as moral as the Europeans who are like literally ahead of them as far as civilization by like a thousand years. Like, come on, stop well, living I, in the fantasy world. I d definitely, and I think that the <laughs> and this is interesting. I'm not big on the AI sphere, right? I, I'm sort of unconvinced that AI is nearly as revolutionary as everyone says it is. Uh, I could be wrong there. And it's great for memes, reason, I'm gonna say that. <laughs> oh yeah, 100%. But part of the reason I am, I, I'm kind of firm in that belief is that AI will never, allow, never be allowed to be what it would need to be to be truly revolutionary, right? There are guards yeah, placed on it. For yeah. purely Aiden ideological said, reasons. Yeah, Aiden, Aiden said the same thing, is that the only way it can really rival a human being is if you if you give it the free will of a human being. And just from the sheer power of the technology, the regime will never do that. I actually have a, I have a, a bone to pick with Aiden Paladin, uh, <laughs> which is that... I could probably get her on here right now. If I, I have asked her to be on my show three times and never gotten a response and at this point i'm just embarrassed and i'm like yeah no we're done and i'm not gonna ask a fourth time you know it's, it's like double texting a girl or something it's like yeah it's not it's just too embarrassing but uh you know I, I i can ask her <laughs> no I don't, I'm, I'm joking of course right but uh sorry to get back to kind of the the the, the point I'll, I'll, I'll ask i'll ask her tomorrow no, no please don't that's even more humiliating uh no no, is, no 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 We'll just say it's a good conversation. I just want to go on the show. I'll be sly about it. Don't worry about it. All right, fair enough. Well, she, so, might, she might watch this and they're like, oh yeah, good point. <laughs> so point <laughs> is, right? See what she says. So point is, in all of that, right, AI is sort of this like algorithmic, like data sorting machine. And yeah. the problem is, and this goes back to, I mean, even the late 80s, right? When Thomas Sowell was writing, was it, it was civil rights reality or rhetoric it's civil rights an apostrophe second point but he is writing this yeah. 20 years after the civil rights act passed in the u.s and what he what he's talking about is the fact that by every every measurable quantifiable these gaps these achievement gaps are not shrinking and yeah here's the thing i i think you can actually have disparate groups in one political organization right empires work but yeah, you can't pretend that those groups are not different and one of the problems with the civil rights movement in the u.s and this is sold as a lie is the idea that you know black americans thought they were just getting a seat at the table just getting the same chance that is not what they were promised they very explicitly yeah. were promised parity equal results i mean you see this in very shortly i think the civil rights act was 68 and then griggs which is the Griggs v. Duke Power, which is the Supreme Court case that banned IQ testing, right? That banned, Ooh. that basically <laughs> said, if there is a if there is a disparity in outcome, it must be because of discrimination, right? And so anytime there's a disparity in outcome, it will be corrected. That's a six-year gap in time. So if supposedly this great vision of civil rights that we are sold from men like Dev and Lindsay and all these other people it only lasted six years, right? If that's the vision. Yeah. Now, I think that we could probably tell ourselves a cultural white lie, right? And that cultural white lie is, okay, everyone gets the same chance. And if, you know, Clarence Thomas or Thomas Sowell, you know, goes to Harvard and is really smart, we can allow that. 
but also we realize that there will be disparities. You know, there will be yeah, differences. Yeah, and they're the That's exception something of the rule. Work, right, we can make that work. But the problem is, right, that like virus of equality, that need to erase all human difference is just like possessed our elites. Yeah, and I th- I'm not quite sure why. I actually don't have an answer for that. Oh, I mean, I, I think it is, I think it is like pure, like ideological mind. possession. I, I think it's this idea that like that, like what is equal is good. And obviously not for our elites. They enjoy being in charge, but that is like the, the univariate, like the one measuring stick for good versus bad is basically like equality. And so like, obviously like that takes different forms in different times but i think that like that idea one it, it has electoral advantages right like if you increase the, the 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 pool of play i mean and again like andrew jackson did this he won elections by saying more people can vote now all of a sudden all the new voters are like thanks andrew jackson i'm voting for you in the same the same game yeah. was played with with women the same game was played with ethnic minorities the same game was played with with basically like gays and like the the rainbow coalition in the U S and that's part of it. I think another part of it is that the way that the, the left gets power, right. It grows the regime and the regime in the left are kind of synonyms, right. Is yeah, that they break case. apart social bonds, right. So let's look yeah, at, what do. let's look at and what, try and what, forge new ones just based on their own power. Well, right. And use that broken yeah. bond to, to basically create a new apparatus for them to enforce power. So let's look at women, right? Okay. We break apart women and men. Women get the vote. So all of a sudden, right? Well, now we need we need the whole HR apparatus, right? To 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 or to like decide disputes between men and women. We need the whole Title IX apparatus, which means that you know for every dollar spent on men's sports, there has to be a dollar spent on women's sports. Okay. Oh God. We, we and so what you basically done is create and those are just two examples. There are dozens more. There's divorce court. There's all of these things, which has knock on effects, of course, right? Creates yeah. new regime positions to fill with your cronies, right? Look at HR departments in the U.S. They're full of basically DNC like hirelings. Like it's an incredibly yeah. good strategy to stay in power, but it ruins and the society. HR lady. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You st- it's it's quite fascinating to look at the gaming world. There's like a good microcosm of how everything goes wrong because you'll notice the amount of... And it's it's a good example to use because it's a very... It's probably like the last very male-dominated arena in our society next to like sports. Um, but the the gaming one is more culturally, culturally relevant, especially for people in our sphere that are more the dissident variety. And you can really see like... Um, do you know V... Uh, the, the Romanian, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, he and I, this is like, uh, you and I are friends, but like the one arena where he and I disagree is um, he thinks it's ideology, not women. And I am much more in the, uh, no, everything is the fault of fucking women in so many ways. And the reason I say this is because uh, there's a play that Aristophanes did, who's a Greek playwright like several hundred years ago, called The Assembly Woman. And it's a satirical play. What happens if you give women equality? And they basically go full communist. Like, they literally full communist. They like equality, like, literally to the point of like, they get to decide who's having sex and the ugly women get first because they don't have a shot because they're ugly. Just like absurd levels. And you look at that, and you go, holy shit, this is literally our, this is, this is supposed to be a satirical play of thousands of years ago. And this is the way our society is run right now. What in the holy hell is going on? Why is our entire society mimicking a satirical play of centuries ago that is generally quite jarring and so when i look at that i sort of see it in the in the case of cuz he says it's it's not women's ideology and uh, in my head i'm like that's like saying it's not the gun that did the damage it's the lead I'm like yeah but the gun is what fires the lead that's the mobilizing thing the weak men is the trigger finger women are the gun and the the lead is the ideology but they're the ones that mobilize the fire shot. Well, and this is actually, this is, this is downstream of, again, that, that problem of equality, right? That, in, yes. you know, in most traditional societies, you have very, very strict gender roles, right? Yes. And obviously there's some exceptions to that, you know, like yeah. 
a lot of societies have this kind well, of we idea hate of, exceptions. We do yeah, of course. Like, like this idea of Saturnalia, you know, where it's like one night, you know, like Carnival or whatever, where everything's topsy turvy. But for the most part, it's very rigidly, rigidly enforced. And that's something that, you know, modernity hates, right? For again, that egal egalitarian reason. And so what we've done is we basically, and I talk about this with my wife all the time, right? We've de-sexed both men and women, right? Women Absolutely. need to be kind of knockoff versions of men. And men need yeah. to shed their masculinity and become more feminine. You know, obviously, like the really weird, like there, there's some people who seem to get some kind of like sick kicks out of this, like uh, Dylan Mulvaney or, you know, like all these kind of like horrible, you know, public yeah. figures. But right. What you have there is a case in which like politics is a man's game fundamentally, right? Yeah. Is, is that, that is. function of rule? And you see this in the Bible. You see this in yeah. the, you know, in the Queen Victoria even said this. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so it's it's much the same thing. Like if you tried to, and I'm trying to find a similar thing. Like if you if you took the the function of like raising young children and made that exclusively male, like of course it would go badly, right? Like that's not a good mix. I, I, I kind of disagree with that. Oh really? I'm curious to to hear your your plan for a for an all male uh, daycare there. Uh, I think that men actually make far better raises of uh, of uh, of the youth than women do. Well, I, I'm, I'm talking about like the, small, like toddlers yeah. and babies and such, right? Like I agree that male teachers are important, but yes, but I, I, um, if I, if I'm going to play the left's game of like, Oh, there's no interchangeable difference. I'm like, okay, if that's the case, then all I have to do is just get the men to become as female just for these couple of years. And then just let the masculine kick in for the final years. Because I was saying, um, women raise kids, men raise adults. Hmm. Fair enough. Well, so, and that's something that you would, you would see, I mean, you used to see in, in education. That is just me like social engineering just for the shits and giggles. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. But my point is, right, like these were separate categories for a reason. You know, it wasn't yes. just some like arbitrary decision. And, and actually, yeah. sorry. It, was, it wasn't just on. based on like systemic oppression and power. No, there's actually function. Well, and this this goes back to that idea of like right versus left, where everything before a certain date is just automatically right and why that's retarded and people. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely dumb. stupid as fuck. But you see the same thing with patriarchy. Right. Where it's like patriarchy just means every other society in human history. Right. At yes. which point that is a garbage definition. Right. Yes. Everything but me is this bad word. It's like, what does that even mean? Yeah. That's, that's unbelievably arrogant. To just look what? at the, hey, look, like all of society was horribly wrong. And then a bunch of feckin' women in like the late 1800s just thought, hey, look, we have an idea. And then they're going to usher in some utopia. Like, do you realize how absurdly stupid that sounds? When it goes back believe to that kind of shit. <laughs> it goes back to like the the nineties liberal professor, right? Where it's like society yeah. started being good when everyone decided I was cool and in charge. And it's like, okay, well, yeah. I, I see your motivated reasoning there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of the it's kind of weird to me that uh, that that is still a, a, a pattern of thinking among so many people, especially nowadays. And it's the point where I'm like, do you can you just stop outside of politics and just examine the absurdity of that idea just for like five minutes. Because I feel like if you did, you would realize that holy shit, our society is unbelievably stupid to the point of absurdity. I mean, yeah, certainly. I mean, it is. And that's, I think the most objectionable part about it is that society is dumb. You know, like yeah. it really is embarrassing. You know, like this, yeah. uh, I think Steve Saylor calls it right. Like the cacistocracy, right. The rule of the awful. <laughs> Which I, I quite oh like that term. God. Yeah, the rule of the awful. That's fucking good. I'm going to use that in the video. Yeah, this, this Steve awful, Saylor guy man, might go really somewhere one day, right? Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, Steve Saylor has... Um, yeah, he's uh, uh, he's definitely said some things I uh, agree with extremely strongly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I follow him on Twitter. I've seen some of the shit he says. I'm like, how am I not being following this guy? Holy crap, he says some really based shit. All of which I like couldn't 90s. agree more with. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and that's actually, he's kind of a funny guy too, because like he's been turned yeah. into this like totem of evil by like yeah. lefties on the internet. And like, if you ever hear him, like he was he's on- He's just uh, really based insane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Like he's just a pretty normal guy. Yeah. But that that's kind of the thing that uh, I think the biggest problem and why I think our society is completely insane is we have demonized truth. Like we have made truth a- social stigma essentially there's um there's a really great article that i read um several years ago i think it's actually 
I think it's still on my channel, actually. Uh, the guy wrote about something called FIBS, Fashion Irrational Beliefs. We said that our society has a great capacity. And AA also wrote about this in something called like the, the political theories, which is why people believe the things that they do. And it's basically what allows the people in power to reign and allows their rule to be accepted by those they rule. And in our time, we believe absolutely insane bullshit things, basically because there's social utility in believing them. And that generally horrifies me to my soul because once you realize that, you're like, oh my good God. So people will believe any insane shit as long as there's popular people who believe it. And that's basically what our entire society gravitates around. And you're like, holy fuck, that is absolutely true. And that's how you can basically manufacture consent, to use a Chomsky phrase, for just us of fucking evil. Like you said, like, look at what the left is trying to do with society. You're like, if I had a shred of morality and I looked at this system, if I if I were to just divorce myself from politics and I had like a, a just a standard Christian upbringing, I was just told, look at the world, all the things that's wrong with it in your head, tell me what you think they are. You would be extremely far right to the point where the State Department would look at you like you're a threat to it. Hi. Hello. You, it's me. Like basically, <laughs> right? Like – and again, right, you're you're 100 true. And there's some of this, right, the kind of like suspension of disbelief in a political sense that like every society does, right? Like, okay, yeah. is the pharaoh really the son of Ra? I don't know, man. Maybe, maybe not, right? <laughs> but at the same time, right, like that that that's sort of a, a justification. It doesn't matter in the same way yeah. that you know the sort of falsehoods we've internalized do. And one of the, the things that is particularly interesting about this, and there's this essay, I cannot remember where you can find it, but it, it's called uh, Luxury Beliefs, right? And it's this idea uh. that so many of those fibs are basically like class signifiers, right? So for instance, like- Yeah, 100%. Like, like 100%. even terms like the, the constantly changing language where like my great-grandmother, bless her heart, calls people Negroes, which is very rude currently because that was the <laughs> polite term when she was a girl, right? Yes. Her children say blacks, my parents mm -hmm. say, you know, African-Americans. And now, you know, someone my age, if they were, you know, more inclined to be agreeable would say people of color, right? And each one yeah. of those allows you to create a distinction between those who are in on, you know, in the know, right? Those who are on the good side of things and those who are old fashioned. But you see this as yeah. well with like beliefs about like uh, polygamy, right? That was really fashionable for the elite to say like 10 to 15 years ago. But that trickles down, right? And those ideas are sort of believed more. They're actually lived out by like the middle and underclass. You know, so for instance, you see now it's like marriage for, you know, the, the extremely high earners, you know, child production is actually significantly higher than the middle class, for example, right? And it's because they took that upper class language of kind of like sexual revolution and lived it out more. And it basically just blew up those, like those social classes, right? Like the, the white working class in America, the white working poor is just demolished by ideas that were kind of fashionable a while back. Yeah. And now to a great detriment to them. <laughs> Yeah, Sean Wyland is exactly right. It's like, don't say colored, say people of color, right? Oh my and, God, don't fucking get me started on that. Because well, it's in my, actually an in my, in my country, Africa, they're an actual right? people. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Because if you, because, and it's, it's in, in America, the, in American parlance, that's um, like a really bad way to say basically anyone of color. But in South Africa, when you say colored people, mm. you're, you're referring to a specific group. And I really enjoy it just saying that to Americans because it just pisses them off. <laughs> like, no, no, no. In my country, that's an actual group of people. That, that's that means not... something different, right? It's like your yes. weird hybrids of yeah. like Malaysians. Yeah, and, and... I, I get to be really condescending and go like, listen, America, not everything is all about you, okay? There's other countries <laughs> that exist. And like, get off your fucking high horse. You know, the only time you ever get to learn about any other countries is when there's fucking tanks involved, uh, <laughs> which is a line yeah, that does not enough. go over well, but it does make me laugh, so... Well, actually, that's a, that's a that's been a wild ride, right? As someone who kind of grew up in the in the Bush era, to see to see the libtards go from like you know no more wars for oil or whatever 
you know, like really upset about George Bush invading, uh, you know, Iraq to being like, rah, 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 we will fight to the death. Like we will fight Russia to the death, you know, nukes for the Kremlin, just like completely 180 on that. It's been wild. Oh God. See. Yeah. That's just honestly fucking insane. I found it funny. Um, did you see, do you know this, this game that just came out now, uh, Hell Divers 2? Oh yeah. My, uh, my friends are playing it, but I, I've not given it a yeah. shot Yeah. Yeah. A friend of mine is, um, he's Muslim and he said to me, oh my God, please get the game and play with me. I'm like, okay, give me like a month because I'm getting a new computer as well. And then I said, oh, I'll, I'll get it. And a bunch of people have also said to me, as soon as they saw it, that is when like Spoon Gaming Streams went, I'm like, like well, give, give me a couple of weeks. Let me just get my new PC and then I'll, I'll fucking stream and see what it's like. Um, but the reason I just thought it was so funny because I watched the trailer and just it's like, part of me is like, this is so fucking cringe, but funny at the same time. Because it, they're just like saying, oh, look, liberty and freedom and spread and democracy. I'm like, you do realize fucking just throw an American flag on this and a bald eagle. And this is literally the Bush Iraq fucking war. It's the exact yeah, same. Team America, slogan. Right? Yeah, it's totally Team America. <laughs> yeah. It, like, it's, oh, look, it's fascist. Like, it's not fascist, you fucking idiot. This is literally like the same fucking war policy slogan in from like 20 years ago. This is not fucking fascism at all. No, 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 no. You don't understand it. This time we replace... Uh, country music and fried chicken with gay marriage and Zelensky. And it's oh, completely God. different, right? <laughs> and uh, that's actually, realism. that's one of the the interesting things to watch right in, in the West is we're talking about the kind of like disillusion of things is the quality of leaders has dropped off so like dramatically. Dramatically, yeah. Like you look at a man like... Uh, like George H.W. Bush, right? Who I don't particularly like. He's kind of a CIA stooge, right? But yeah, no one doubted that he was a serious guy. You know, no one was like, George H.W. Bush isn't really in control of the country. But I mean, like, yeah. do you know anyone who thinks Biden is in charge of America? Like, if they do, <laughs> I don't consider them sentient human beings. <laughs> I mean, I would not consider Biden a sentient human being. No, e exactly. Be that, that's that's my point. So when people, just, I always just find it so bizarre when they say that like, Biden's doing a good job. I'm like, what fucking world do you live in? You <laughs> absolute lunatic. Just like yeah. sipping tea and like sniffing hair. But dude, the, the motherfucker needs a fucking like, he needs, he needs like notes on where to fucking stand, sit and to breathe. Like you think this motherfucker is running the country? And the most amazing thing is when they said, oh, he's uh, he's not competent enough to stand trial. I'm like, how the fuck is he competent enough to run the fucking nation then, you retards? What the fuck is going on? Well, and that's that's one of the things. Is that, insane. And this has really been, been uh, interesting to watch, especially since, since COVID, is that all pretense of, like, normalcy, all pretense of neutrality is gone. Like, we've Completely all admitted, gone. Utterly gone. like, science is completely politicized right like institution like vote counting is politicized health is politicized you know all yeah. of these things that were viewed as kind of like just upstanding american institutions are fair game and uh yeah. i mean obviously reporting has become very much that and uh again right like i can't help but laugh at these people having destroyed all of their credibility now don't get me wrong they're still in power but they are also yeah. embarrassing themselves left, right, and center, which, like, if society's going to fall apart, at least it might as well be funny. Yeah, that's, I would say as well, that is, um, if I was an American and I was trying to, to sell them on the idea of a king, I would lead with that idea. I would lead with the idea that, I said this to a friend of mine, the best way for you guys to sell, like, hypothetically, Trump as, like, a king is to tell them that you want to liberate the people from the burden of politics because your current aristocracy is basically a joke. And I just dress it up with like typical liberty and freedom behavior and allow them to keep their guns. And I can guarantee you conservatives will eat that shit up all damn day. They would have no problem with an American Caesar as long as they think the Caesar's on their side. Guarantee you. Just tell them that I said to them the, the, the exact phrase I used was tell them you wish to animate the American Constitution in a worthy vessel and free it from the gangbang it's currently trapped in. I mean, they will, and eat, if you that, look at they will the, eat that up. Then they if will. you look at like the historical context in which these Caesar-like figures have appeared, that's literally yeah. what they did, right? Like, yes, Napoleon said a whole lot about you know the spirit of the revolution, right? But 
what does that really mean? Right? Like, what does that really mean? And I think that, you know, in, in any culture, right, you know, America, any others, you will always have certain kind of vestiges of that, right? Like yeah. even in the UK, which is an absolute like, disaster, Shit they show. still refer back to, you know, certain founding documents, certain sort of like political traditions, even when they're very obviously not, you know, living in accordance with them. And I think you yeah. could see the same thing in America, right? At least I, I, I for one hope. I think that I am just kind of naturally too pessimistic by uh, to, to, to imagine that happening soon. Yeah, exactly, right. But uh, we have a few super chats I want to want to roll into. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, Seamus O. Blackie for five dollars. <laughs> uh, Black History Great Month. Name. Yeah, I know. Really, I assume that's your <laughs> given name. A uh, Black History Month went out the same as my dad with a bang. <laughs> I need a rim shot effect for some of these. You guys make me read dumb stuff. And then Trey 50 Daniel said, you should have V on. I agree with Spoon, though. It's mostly the women. Yeah. yeah. The, the There's a great tweet. I think it's by, uh, I think it was by Lafayette Lee or was it maybe someone else, which basically says like, you know, times like these make you understand why every civilization ever put constraints on women. You yeah. Know? It's, <laughs> I butchered that, the quote, that it, but... Yeah, but that that is actually a good point, and that's sort of the thing that that um I I disagree with V about because V is a very very sharp guy, but I don't like this particular argument. It's because he uses the exception to make his argument, and that's like the one thing I don't like about his claim. Is because he said, "Well, look at Japan, like Japan has female authors," and I'm like, "Yes, V, that's true, but why is that the case?" Well, Japan why is also Japan the fairly exception? patriarchal. Yes case in point is like you can have the exception of women but then they can only exist when men protect them because in the reality is um i said this to, i said this to somebody if you are a guy or just say uh, if you're a parent are you a good parent if you enable the child completely no you were you're a good parent if you know when to say fucking no and when it comes to women you need to learn to tell women to shut the fuck up once in a while. And no, you can't just do whatever the hell you want without any repercussions. Because clearly when you fucking do dumb shit, you ruin fucking nations. Because historically speaking, like you just said, like every fucking society in all of human history have kept women in a lock and fucking and chain. And if it's across cultures, across time, the one thing that they all have in common is you all have fucking ovaries. So there might be a reason why you women particularly, for some bizarre reason, just gravitate towards screwing society up whenever you get fucking power i don't know why i suspect it's because you're hardwired for that kind of shit um i, well, I said something thing. on twitter I, I, I just want to make this joke because it's kind of horrible but it's funny i said the reason why men keep women barefoot uh women barefoot and pregnant and in the kitchen is not because they hate women it's because they like everything else around them because clearly when women are outside of that they just fuck shit up uh, certainly right and, and like kind of true it, it knows and, and like everything else right that again because this was kind of you know poisonous fruit right it, both the the end goal was bad but it also failed to even achieve that right the end goal is yes. sold was you know you will be like a man you know you will have you will be equal you will be the same and you will be by extension happy and yeah. we have not created equality we've created a crude facsimile of it We've yeah. made everyone miserable, right? Like the female happiness paradox, right? Which is as liberation continues by every measurable, you know, perceived life happiness, you know, fulfillment, suicide rate are manifestly worse off. And to me, again, this goes back to this point where it's like, you do not have the moral high ground. You know, you, you people, this, this kind of sick ideology has, has ruined quite possibly the, 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 the greatest civilization the world has ever known. And for what, yeah. right? To, to convert calories into like cheap food, right? To, to enable people to have like nice RVs and, you know, one generation to have a good retirement, right? We burnt it all yeah. for this, you know, a, a false like goal of equality. And I mean, like you, you can understand why guys get a little bit angry about it. Yeah. And then they just say, oh, well, I think it's because, um, <sighs> It's it's kind of a weird position to be in because I I don't see this ending well. 
And the reason I say that is because um, it's going to require women to say sorry they fucked up. Good fucking luck with that. Women are not known for apologizing for fucking anything. So <laughs> getting them to admit they're wrong and give up power, nah, that's not going to fucking happen in my lifetime. At least not without a fucking fight. And um, that's a really fucking short fight. If <laughs> The only way women get better is if they voluntarily give up power. I don't know how the hell you're going to convince them of that, but you will have to eventually say, hey, hey, ladies, you really fucked up literally everything. You were sold a complete snake oil, mainly by other women. And um, the only way to fix this is to let men be men and take care of you. And um, you need to learn to shut the fuck up once in a while. And by the way, someone in the chat just said, <laughs> Spoon's high power levels. Dude, you have no fucking idea what my power level is. I hide so fucking much on YouTube. Jesus fucking Christ. Like 80% of my thoughts, I don't fucking vocalize. Like if, if people, were, if the regime ever finds a way to read minds, Jesus Christ, I'll be in prison. <laughs> Easily. It'll be crowded there. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Uh, John Carter, uh, my cyber bully, uh, you need to give women, you need to give women child, children and household work. Uh, household educational work, I assume, or household work to keep them from becoming civilization wrecking busybodies. True. Yes, yeah, Jack, true. that means you. He is again making fun of me for being married several months and not having a kid yet, which uh, I guess fair. But anyway, yeah, I think that there's there's something to that. And again, it's just this like spreading disorder in everything, you know? Yes, yeah, it, speak, it speaks often in Carrie Big Spoon. There was a really good uh, qu uh, quote that I saw on Twitter a while ago, and this is so fucking true, and it's kind of depressingly true. Um, it was something along the lines of, you uh, you either hide your power level and get accused of being controlled opposition or show it and reveal yourself to be a fed. Oh, of course. There's there's no way like, to win holy that. Holy shit, that, it, that is so true. And really, it's one of those things where it's like, and yeah, this is something that you have to be, you have to be delicate about and you and I have not done a particularly good job about it this evening, but it's like, yeah, <laughs> you can sort of get away with anything if you say it in the right way. Yes. And, uh, like I said, that this is a case in which I better I'm normally better at than I am tonight, but yeah, sorry you about do that. You do have to, no, I, look, man, I, I don't mind, <laughs> uh, but you sort of have to, you have to speak circumspectly about certain topics and it's yeah, basically do. just because there's this giant like sort of Damocles over your head and it yeah. doesn't like you can get yeeted for no reason. Now, admittedly, I'm primarily an audio podcaster, right? That's where the majority of my audience is. So it matters less, but all the same, it's like, it is a little bit like you're kind of, it's kind of a catch 22. It's right. Like you, you can't, you can really not win that situation one way or the other. No. Yeah. You are basically trying to avoid the eye of Sauron while trying to essentially try and take it out. Uh, Trey 50 Daniel said spoon is right. And I think the best case scenario is women getting into a trend of giving up power in the house, similar to Tradwick TikTok. I mean, I think that's something to it. I mean, I, honestly, to be honest, I, I've said that's a redundant phrase, but I think that if, if anything comes out of this, this, there will be a sort of crash situation, you know, where, Do you know, what's the best way to sell it to women. Hmm. Tell them that you're not giving up power. You're transferring it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the, I've something that I've noticed with people is people are very receptive to, to language and, and especially ideas. And what women like now is the idea of power but they don't actually want any of the responsibility of power, which is why they can just basically do a whole lot of bad shit and not get fucking punished for it. So you need to convince them that they can have a better life and actual power in a way that it, it actually matters, which would be to raise a family. And they would be a lot happier with that way. I mean, you can just tell them, hey, look, it's just worked for thousands of years. Like, how? what have you got to lose? How do you feel right now? Absolutely fucking miserable. Well, what have you I got to lose? It... Like, really? It sort of is a kind of a, a prisoner's dilemma, right? Because at least in the in the current situation, both men and women have the opportunity to kind of screw each other, right? Yeah. In different ways. And, and not in the good way. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, literally, right? Look at Gen Z. <laughs> but uh, oh God, you, you sort of have this situation where it's like, okay, if material conditions don't change, right? If material conditions do change and for instance, access to pharmaceuticals and you know kind of like fake email jobs goes away right this could the whole conversation could change but like really yeah. the it's it is exactly like the prisoner's dilemma where 
you know, either you can have a mutually disadvantageous choice, right? Where both of you screw each other over, or you're kind of going to have to risk it. And I realize that's not a particularly comforting thing to say because there's a risk. It is a real risk. You can get screwed, right? Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, what are your other options? You know, we're not in a particularly good situation and waiting until it fixes at itself least, yeah. is just... At least with a gamble, you can win. Exactly. Because with right. the other one, it's guaranteed misery. Certainly. Anyway, man, we are... Wow, we blew past time. This was a, a really fun conversation. I enjoyed it, but I'm going to have to to wrap this up. But if people want to find you and in, in your work, what's a good way for them to do that, man? Uh. I think on, um, hold on, I'll put it in chat here quick. Uh, I should have your YouTube channel linked in the description. I can just copy that. About it. All right, no worries. That's that's my uh, my Twitter handle in the box there. Okay. And um, yeah, Aristocratic Utensil is where you'll find me on on uh, on YouTube. I'm actually in the process of, uh, of writing a long piece on America's constitutional problems. Hmm. Uh, and the very first thing I do is make fun of guns just to piss off the right wingers. Just like if I can just get you really annoyed and this is the worst you'll feel, then the rest of it will be an easy ride. <laughs> just like do something in reverse, basically. Like normally I'm like, I work people in before I hit them with the heavy stuff. I'm like, no, I'm going to like basically bloody your nose and then tell you like, yeah, just sit down for a moment. And then we can have a conversation to see where this goes. No, that's um, fair. No, I, I did a yeah. piece in the blaze that did a similar thing. And I will say most people got it, but there were some really funny, like boomer waffen comments. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I will say in, in my case, I've, um, I've not had many Americans be very aggressive um, at me towards uh, the monarchical idea. I think it's because I don't actually shit on their country. I don't actually tell them the, their country is even horrible. I say like, no, I can respect what your country is trying to be. I just think that your ideal form would be better realized with a good executive rather than Congress, who you guys hate. Like, if you just say to people, you know what, uh, Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi can fuck off, people tend to be quite favorable with that. Well, well certainly, <laughs> right? And I think that a lot of people, you know, particularly on the political right, are just really, really tired of nonsense, right? Are really yeah. tired in, it's sort of this, and this goes back to the Bukele example, right? Where it's like, tired of being beset with solvable problems, right? Yeah. Things that it's like, well, okay. And I've, I've since moved away, but I lived in a city where, you know, open drug use was common. There were lots of shootings, you know, people would, would relieve themselves both in a liquid and solid form on my doorstep. And like, you just look around and you're like, why do I have to live like this? You know, we yeah. didn't used to. And I think that, you know, as that, that kind of exasperation grows, it's more and more just like, I don't care fix it yeah. you know take this away and i think that you're you're probably on to something there yeah but i, I, I have a, yeah I, let me just say one last thing and i think this is something that people should really realize um the the argument for like a tyrant becomes a lot easier to sell if you tell people what you want to be tyrannical with because i tell i thought as um if i was going to sell this to people i would say if you form tyranny in your head Realize what you think is tyranny and what a left winger thinks is tyranny are two very, very different things. Like if I said to you, I was if I were to get in power, I would ban gay marriage entirely. I would probably make it illegal to the point of throwing people in jail. I would make communism punishable by death. Um, I would invest a crap load of money in city beautification. I would like make Art Deco a mandatory style. And I would uh, fire the bureaucracy to hell. And I would make crime significantly more punished. Most people would look at that and go, that's not so bad. Like, yeah, it's because you don't mind those things. So realize what you think of tyranny. Like if I said it to a left winger, they would be fucking tearing their eyes out and think I'm some horrific hell demon. To a conservative, that sounds fairly normal. So you should really consider like, what exactly do you think is tyranny? <laughs> like, yeah. When someone says that, ask what they think tyranny is, maybe first. So two last super chats. Uh, John Carter, again, speaking of women, when are you recording an episode with Candace Owens? Uh, oh, God. That is, I would probably... Uh, she has not asked me. I'll put it that way. Uh, QWERTY uh, for $5 Canadian. So that's roughly $1.80 in real money. Uh, consensus is a monarch you can't throw a stick at. Very true. That's the kind of argument in uh, 
in Moldbug's uh, kind of like formalism uh, essays. But uh, again, Spoon, thank you so much for coming on. This was a was a fun conversation. Yeah, no problem. And if you guys want to find the movie gay for you, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not that. Jeez, I'm not that charming, but thank you, I suppose. <laughs> uh, if you guys want to find my stuff, uh, this show is available on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you want to support us more directly, you can check out our sponsor, Axios Remote Fitness and Coaching. Uh, JD is a legitimately terrifying human being. He could probably rip me in half. And if you want to get that strong, Axios is the place to check it out. And again, everyone, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night.